I want to thank you for clicking onto this link. This um, opportunity to be with you will have two parts. The first part, I'm going to spend some time talking about how we closed out 2020 and what we expect to find in 2021 as a parish family. And then we'll have a second part, which is the tour of our campus. Now, uh, you can click on either one or come back to these if you, as you would like. Um, uh, my hope is that you'll watch both. I hope you'll forgive me for being in casual clothes as I share this time with you. In a little bit, as you'll see when we take the tour, it, it requires not business clothes, but a little bit more rough and ready clothes. Um, since it is an important time for our being together, I'd like to begin with a prayer if I could. So wherever you are, if you're with someone you love, take their hand and let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for St. Martin's, for the St. Martin's family, for her mission, for the opportunity to know you and serve you in and through this wonderful church family. Bless this opportunity to be together. Even though it's a virtual experience, may it be an opportunity to bind us more closely to one another as a church family and to you as our Lord. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So normally in late January, we would have an annual parish meeting. We would call the parish together. It's open to all um, who are part of the St. Martin's family. We would give you a report of the year gone by. We would talk a little bit about the plans ahead. We would elect vestry. We would present a budget to you. But because of the circumstances, we're not able to do that. So, uh, and in fact, the Articles of Incorporation of St. Martin's and the Canons of the Church actually require that we have an annual parish meeting. So we will have an annual parish meeting. At some point when we feel comfortable about coming into a, a, a place and a time where we're having an open gathering where no one is excluded, then we'll call that. So hopefully the late spring, early summer, maybe even in the middle of the summer, um, but we will have that meeting and we'll actually ratify some of the things that we've already put into place. One of those things was mentioned in a recent edition of the Star, and that was the decision to retain all those who were elected to the vestry last year and ask those who had been serving to, add, to serve another year. In other words, the sitting vestry will remain in place for an extra year as it would have been almost impossible to carry out our nomination process and the election without um, being with one another, without having the regular kind of experience of church that we do. So after checking with the bishop and going through our canons and checking with our, our chancellor and our legal counsel, uh, we put that into play. And a lot of other nonprofits are actually doing that right now in order to keep that leadership in place. And actually, there's another benefit to that. Uh, this, is, of course, is an incredible year that we're about to face together in 2021. We're going to see the completion of our Building for the Ages project. And a lot of the people who've been sitting on the vestry have really been part of the planning and decision making of the Building for the Ages project all the way through. And so it would be good to have them in place and not have to kind of reorient a new batch of vestry members into what's going on. So with that said, let's let me kind of give you a couple little things about the year gone by and some things that we're planning for the year ahead. I will tell you, we are in the process, our communications department under direction of Sue Davis, they, they are in the process of putting together an annual report. It, it, it's written. Normally, we just have that available at the parish meeting, uh, but we're going to produce enough to send to every household at St. Martin. So that'll be getting in your hands relatively soon. I do want to thank, uh, before I go any further, I, I just can't say enough about the incredible staff that you have here at St. Martin's, the Sextons, the uh, groundskeepers, the administrative support team, the program team, and of course your wonderful clergy. And I also want to thank the vestry, the, uh, and in particular uh, the president of the Senior Council, Culver Stedman, our Senior Warden Jim Hebert, our Junior Warden Titus Harris, uh, our Missions Chair Anya McInnes, our clerk, Diane Campbell, and the fellow who I've asked to be chancellor since my very first year, many years ago, Andy Harvin, who stayed on as our, our parish ch chancellor. So I'm so grateful for, for that group, uh, the vestry, and particularly that smaller group, the executive committee of the vestry. They really do help guide the clergy and your rector to do the work we're given to do. Uh, and I'm so grateful for them. Let me say a word about our plans for opening back up before I dip into you know, last year, uh, I want to start by saying we, we are thinking through a lot about how we return to life uh, here at St. Martin's. I, I, I do want to say, uh, and I hope you are, uh, taking advantage of the growing circle of those being vaccinated. 
If you have that opportunity, please do so. Um, I'm going to do it as soon as I can. Uh, and, and in the meantime, we need to continue to be careful with each other. Wear your mask, sanitize your hands, keep your distance. I know you're exhausted about that uh, with that, and I know we'd all like that to come to an end. I'm going to say a word about that at the end of my time here. Uh, but, but we are thinking through what happens when, when St. Martin's opens up again. So we're looking ahead to Lent and to Easter and beyond, and lots of conversations with the clergy about that. As you know, one of the things that is kind of guiding us um, is the, the growth of the COVID-19 virus. And so we pay particular attention to the surges and the spikes. Uh, though right now, today, uh, uh, it looks like things are starting to slow down, at least in the Houston area, that could have changed tomorrow. So we're tuned into that. As you know, right now, at present, uh, we have one Sunday service that is the traditional service uh, that is live, but is also offered virtually. So you can uh, watch it at home, live streamed. You can be here in present, or you can watch it later. Uh, we also have the family table service, which in the same way is live, streamed, uh, and can be watched later. We do have an, uh, the altar service has been meeting via Zoom. Uh, so that also is another worship service. Then on Wednesday, we have a noon service that's live and virtual. Uh, and then Wednesday evening, there's a Compline service. It's a Zoom service. So you can actually dial in and be part of a group of St. Martin's members at 8 p.m. On, on Wednesday evenings to be part of Compline. Uh, and then, as you know, there, there are just a myriad, I'm not going to go through all of them, there are a myriad of Christian education opportunities um, for adults and young adults, for students and children. We've maintained uh, not only you know, Sunday, Sunday school, Christian education on Sundays, but there are other opportunities as well. In particular, the Daily Word that comes out from uh, St. Martin's. And uh, a lot of you have said how much that means to you and that you hope that continues. And I will share with you that that will continue. I'm grateful to all of our clergy and those who participated in those learning opportunities. But in particular, Dr. Suze McBay, who has kind of guided us in planning our education to adults. And she's also the one who writes the assignments and does the editing for the Daily Word. So um, hats off to Suze. We're coming up on Lent soon. I will share with you. Um, it will be very important for you to read your February star and your March star, because those will be the stars that will tell you a lot about Lent and Easter. Uh, we will have Ash Wednesday services. At this point, point we're planning four, an additional service than the traditional three, uh, because we want to meet as many people as we can. So at this point, we're planning services at 8 a.m., noon, 3.30 p.m., and 6 p.m. Um, and we're planning a Wednesday night teaching series uh, on the theme of understanding Jesus as the bread of life, a five-week series. Uh, at this point, we are planning for a limited number of people to be able to come and be part of a live experience, have a pick-up, pre-prepared supper, and how that's all going to happen we'll announce as we get closer to those Wednesday nights. So probably 50 to 75 that would be in the parish hall. Normally we have several hundred who come. But that will be live streamed as well. So Wednesday evening teaching and uh, Susan McVeigh and I are going to be doing some of the teaching as are some of the clergy. And yes, there, there will be magic. Thursday afternoons, a gathering with the clergy um, live and virtual on unexpected teachers. And that will be on Thursday afternoons, something we've done uh, for years now. Um, so I, uh, again, I keep saying all these are the plans. Uh, tomorrow we could turn around and the plans could change. But uh, that's the plan we're making right now. I hope you'll participate as much as you can during the holy season of Lent. Palm Sunday, Easter Sunday, learn more about that in March as we get closer. Okay, so a couple of things about um, uh, th this year ahead. I'm going to come back to a few things about 2020, but let me say as part of our planning, um, the construction that has dominated our campus for over a year is coming to a close. We're very excited that it looks as though we will um, be pretty much through with everything by Easter. Some of you will remember that we had planned a uh, dedication and blessing service back in December with the hope that the virus would be, we went through the virus, and then we moved that to Palm Sunday, and then we thought about May, and it's obviously still hanging on. This is my feeling. I would rather not have an event like that until everybody who wants to come can come. 
This is something so many hundreds of people have invested of themselves um, into this project. And I, I think it's vital that those who want to be part of a celebration, a dedication, uh, can be here. And so uh, we've moved that off. Even though the buildings will be complete, we will probably not begin to move in and use them liturgically or in other ways uh, until we've got a lot. Once we get in, we've still got a lot of work to do. We have some building policies to put into place. We have to begin kind of looking at the impact on our budget as we uh, look at the cost to maintain and um, keep those spaces clean, neat and tidy. We haven't had to do that so far. So once we get in, we'll probably find out uh, what that will really require. And then once we can open wide, uh, we will do that. Right now, we have plans for dedication and celebration on Saturday, August 21st and Sunday the 22nd. And I say it's a two-day process because there's several areas, as you'll see on the second half of our video today, that, um, uh, that will have private dedications. They've been given by an area, has been given by a family, or, or an individual, and so we'll have some private dedications. Then on Sunday, we'll, we'll have a large dedication service. There's gonna be some celebratory um, gatherings around that as well. Uh, bishop Don Wimberly, who was uh, formerly the Bishop of, uh, of Texas, uh, and was the Bishop when I came as your rector uh, 13 and a half years ago, he's actually gonna come and be part of the celebration that day. And there'll be several other special guests, but we'll let you know as we get closer to August. Now, as we get into next year, we had some wonderful things planned for the 2020-2021 program year, all of which got kind of wiped out. So let me just kind of give you some highlights. I've been in touch with each of those we've invited to speak, and almost all of them have agreed to be here next year. So among those, um, my friend Gene Becker, who was the chief of staff for President George H.W. Bush, and pulled together a wonderful book on Barbara Bush entitled Pearls of Wisdom. She's going to be coming on a Sunday to be with us, and um, we're going to talk a little bit about that book, and we'll have a book signing. Bishop Carl Wright, who's the Bishop of the Armed Services, will be here with us on St. Martin's Day, and he'll preach in the morning. He's a bishop, and he'll preach in the evening. He's been part of the Armed Services at our Veterans Day service. Uh, the presiding bishop was to be here for our dedication. He, as you can imagine, he has a really very full schedule. But he and I have been in contact all year, and he really wanted to come to St. Martin's. But, but his schedule became so full in the summer and the fall uh, that it was hard to get him to be with us for the dedication. However, and I think this will be just as special an opportunity, he is going to be with us in the middle of December. Uh, he'll come in on a Friday evening. He'll offer an Advent quiet day, uh, and then he'll preach for us on that Sunday, the second Sunday of Advent. So delighted to say that Bishop uh, Michael Curry, presiding bishop with the Episcopal Church, is a wonderful preacher, wonderful teacher, and has been a spiritual friend to me for a number of years now, will be with us. As we get into the spring of 2022, uh, I've been telling you a lot about this fellow for a couple of years. I met a few years ago, Jean-Pierre East Boots. He's a wonderful writer and puts together a lot of books and programs and videos and films with National Geographic. Uh, he was gonna be with us, uh, two Lent's ago, then this past Lent, and, and now he's moved out to Lent of 2022. Uh, what is great is in that time that he has not been with us, he's actually completed two more books, one on women of the Bible, and one on, uh, the, I kind of joked around a little bit, but it's about the history of the world. And so uh, by the time he gets here, those books will be out, and he'll spend a weekend with us teaching and having some book signings, having some lectures. He's wonderfully gifted, uh, writer and historian and biblical um, scholar and is a Christian. So it would be great to have him with us. Then on uh, Maundy Thursday and Good Friday, uh, John Meacham, as you know, John has written a lot of books uh, about culture, about politics, uh, about history of America over the years. He's a wonderful speaker. He's a faithful Episcopalian. He'll actually be preaching for us on Maundy Thursday and Good Friday 2022. And of course, we'll have other guests and, uh, that we have. We love to have Jim Jackson come and be with us. We love to have Dave Peterson come and be with us. And the plans are to continue to keep them part of our teaching, preaching opportunity, in addition to the wonderful clergy that you already have. Now, as we, as we look to uh, the reopening of, of St. Martin's as a parish family, we are beginning to do a lot of thought and and reflection and prayer on what that will look like. We're doing some 
uh, what I would call revisioning. Uh, we're looking at our existing worship services, for instance. Uh, we probably will enhance those. We'll probably shape, change the shape and kind of the structure of some of those. In particular, um, the, uh, the contemporary services, and I'll say a word about that later as we go during, uh, spend time during the tour. Uh, we are now looking at, at services that would uh, invite us to contemplative worship, Celtic worship, centering prayer, um, because we're going to have so many more opportunities with the expanded space that we have. So i uh, really excited to say that that is something that's underway, and when we open our doors again, wide open, uh, not only will we have more worship, but we'll have more education, fellowship opportunities as well. Now let me say a word about um, finances, and I'm going to ask you not to fast forward at this point. Now I do want to say a word about what, of course, makes all this possible, and that is um, the collective uh, giving of our parish. And of course, it is the giving of your time. It is the giving of your talent. So much of what normally happens here at St. Martin's could not happen without the volunteer sweat equity to make um, Christian education and worship and outreach to the community a reality. Um, so I appreciate the time and the talent that you give. I appreciate the fact that we're prayer partners and, and making St. Martin's the kind of church that we feel like we're called to be by our Lord. Uh, but we do have to pay for those things. So I want to say a word about our finances and where we closed out 2020 and then where we're looking as, as we turn the page to 2021. I am really pleased to share with you, for those of you who were at the parish meeting last year, you will remember that we had some surprises in our budget that meant we finished in the red at the end of last year, and not just in the red, but deeply in the red over a million dollars, and I had to stand up in the parish meeting and share that, share how we got there. It was nothing uh, other than surprises that occurred, some major expenses we had on campus, unrelated construction, and some other things that happened, but um, within about 10 days, due to the generosity of St. Martin's, once I made that known, that gap was closed, and I was so grateful for that. So that meant we, we actually closed that gap and we stepped into 2020, uh, with uh, more, more um, financial support than we had expected to have. So as we made it through this year, I can assure you that we were very careful not knowing what 2020 would look like in the middle of this pandemic. As we made it into this year, we carefully monitored our expenses. We carefully um, uh, watched our personnel. We basically had a, a hiring freeze, though I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. Um, and then as pe we had some people retire this year, uh, and as they retired, we didn't, we didn't replace those, those people. Um, now, um, that coupled with the fact that um, we did apply for and were approved for the PPP loan, and we did spend it only in accordance with the guidelines we were given, as long as a one-quarter forgiveness of the diocesan assessment. And that was a decision made by our bishop, Andy Doyle, who was thinking about his parishes, and I'm very grateful for the fact that he gave us a quarter off. And as St. Martin's, is not only is the largest church in the diocese, but is the largest Episcopal church in America, uh, we are the biggest giver for the Diocese of Texas. So that meant a lot. A couple of those things, along with a lot of surprise gifts throughout the year. We got a lot of people who realized this would be a tough year. And so they stepped forward, and we even had a foundation or two that sent them some support, which means I'm pleased to share with you, not only did we close 2020 in the black, solidly in the black, but we now have a, a surplus that we have, and we can put in our reserve account to carry us over into 2021. Now, the 2021 budget is, as is every budget, as we, which, which the vestry just approved, is, a, is an exercise in uh, hope and faith and prayer. I'll say that up front. Um, we have heard from a lot of people in the parish, but is, in fact, more than we normally hear from this time of year. Um, we normally have had a couple of call-a-thons to reach out to members who haven't pledged yet. We've had none of those yet because we wanted to kind of see how stewardship went. Um, and so we, we are now, and I'm, you'll probably get this by the time you get this 
uh, virtual email will be on the on the verge of having another, or actually the first call-a-thon for the 2021 pledging year. So we have not heard from about 500 families that normally pledge. Now we're counting on those who normally pledge, so we're about to be in touch with you. So if you're listening to this message and you're in that group, you can, you can beat out our call by going ahead and renewing your pledge. Um, and you might want to really consider whether or not you're able to increase your pledge. That may sound like a, a really hard thing to do, a really strange request to make, uh, but we, uh, we have been talking to a lot of members about doing that, and I want to share with you that a stunning 46% of all the pledges that we've received so far for 2021 are increases. I'll say that again, 46%. Think about that, given the time in which we're living. It's extraordinary to think that that's what's happened right now. But that said, uh, I need to say to you that, um, as you know, we've said this quite widely, only um, 40% of parish households pledge. That means about 60% of the parish households do not pledge. They may give, but they don't pledge. And so, as you know, we hired a development stewardship director, and we're in the process of reaching out to that 60%, and it seems as though our efforts are are bearing some good fruit as we've had several new first-time pledges for 2021. Uh, but again, as I said a moment ago, we did, while well, we had a hiring freeze, while well, we watched our expenses this year, and needless to say, we didn't have some expenses we normally did. We were able to cut back on security of buildings and grounds and things like that because we weren't in the buildings all the time. Um, I said we had some retirements. Jeruth Graves retired, uh, longest serving uh, staff member of St. Martin's, I think. Kristen Early retired. Deb, Deb Tish retired, Nancy Hasse retired, and the Reverend Ken Fields retired. But those are spots that we need to refill, and we won't be able to do that without your support. I do also want to say that a big growth area for us uh, it has been this virtual world in which we are now moving. I, I really want to give my thanks to Sue Davis and Jorge Ibarra and David Bowen uh, and uh, also our worship leaders team, our vicar, Chad Martin, and Barbara Piana and Beth Owenberger. You know, in the middle of extraordinary times, we had to quickly pivot and create opportunities to worship and learn virtually that 48 months ago, we were not doing any of that. So we're now doing that. And this is one area where we've actually increased our staff, and we're going to have to increase our staff uh, to make that continue. Many of you have said, please, please continue to have these virtual offerings, uh, even after the pandemic comes to a close. So that is the plan. So we've brought on some more staff. Uh, we will soon begin constructing in the back of the church, and it'll take, uh, if, you, if you think about coming into the church and seeing the back uh, pew with the, the audio booth there, we'll stretch that all the way down. It will cover that back area of the church in an equal size but a greater length, and we'll now have an audio-visual booth. Uh, if you have been coming to live church, you know that we have cameras on tripods throughout the church. All those will go away, and we'll have permanently installed cameras. This is not a cheap thing to do. I'm just putting it right out there in front of you. So uh, we do have a big jump in our budget number for next year. Uh, modest increases programmatically. Uh, but we've got to increase our budget in order to meet the virtual needs, both in the equipment that we're going to be using and the staff we need. And we really are reaching incredible numbers. You know, on an average Sunday at St. Martin's before COVID-19, uh, in our six services that we offer, we would have somewhere between 1,700 and 2,000 people who would come worship with us on a, on a Sunday at those six services. Uh, that's a great number. That's actually the largest average attendance at Episcopal Church in the United States of America as well. Uh, the average attendance in the Episcopal Church on Sunday, just for the record, is about 80. So we still have a large group coming, but when we had to shift, pivot, and, and, and change to a new kind of way of worshiping together, um, we created a virtual audience. So now we have um, hundreds and thousands of people who are joining us for worship and virtual learning opportunities. For instance, on Veterans Day, we had about 1,300 households. That's not individuals, that's households 
So if two people tuned in to watch a service, you can double that number. Sometimes I'm sure it's three or four. On Veterans Day, that was 1,300. On January 10th, this is just an example, just a few weeks ago, 1,900 households joined us for traditional worship. Uh, Christmas Eve, well over 2,000 households. Now this, this is, uh, you know, does not include the live people that we've been having come join us in worship. So lots of people joining us. And, um, and what I'm quoting to you is really just the, the YouTube track. This doesn't include the Facebook track. So thousands of people are joining us for worship every Sunday. And in order that, for that to continue, uh, we're going to need to have the necessary equipment and the necessary staff um, to make it happen. However, I'm very anxious uh, to uh, return to being together. Let's, I, I'll probably say a lot more about this as we get into the spring, summer, and next fall. Uh, I don't want that to be a replacement for church for those who can actually be here, but it will be a replacement for those who cannot be with us. And the growing numbers of people who are joining St. Martin's, part of our Christian family uh, on for worship and education, who are from other places in Texas, and actually around the country, and actually some from around the world. So uh, one Sunday, uh, I actually got a call from one of our members who lives half of the year in Nigeria. And uh, I had, uh, he, he immediately called me, uh, and he, he talked about how he had watched worship and wanted to know what was going on in worship. Called me from Nigeria. So, um, so I want to talk just, if I could, spiritually about what we're going through for just a moment. And then we're, I'm, I'm going to come to a close and we're going to go on a tour together. Um, we're all living through a very difficult season. Um, I'm almost 60 and I can't think of a longer period of time that has been this more difficult. Some of our members uh, live through world wars, major conflicts, tremendous economic uh, trials and tribulations. I realize that. Uh, this is the one experience that it, it does in many ways touch everybody on our globe. And in many ways it's touched um, every member of our parish. And I take what's going on very seriously, as I hope you do. Now having prayed with members with whom I cannot be personally uh, over the phone as they are leaving this life for the next, now having had wedding services where bridesmaids and groomsmen are having to wear masks and we can only have a few people having baptisms and having funerals uh, that have to be limited and funerals for our members who have died as a result of the COVID-19 virus. All of these things make every day a greater challenge. And I probably am honest to say I'm COVID weary and I'm sure you are too. There are a lot of what ifs. I would ask you as a parish as a parish family, to continue to be patient with us. Um, we're doing the best we can. I think the clergy are doing the best they can. They're working very hard. We need your patience. Also, bear with us by being flexible. Uh, we're having to make changes often week to week, sometimes day to day. But beyond that, I, I, I want to say that I know, and I think in my conversations with many of you, I know that you're fearful. Many of you are fearful. Many of you are, are worried. But what we are about here at St. Martin's is reminding people that when we are afraid and when we are worried, that we're not alone. One of the reasons we have a church family is to uh, remind those who are part of that family that they have a, a body that stands with them and that we have a Lord who is more powerful and more enduring than a virus, than a sickness, than an economic downturn. Uh, what does Jesus tell us in the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 6? He'll say, do not worry. Remember that? Do not worry about your life. And we might say, yeah, I'm tempted to say, yeah, uh, he doesn't have my life. Um, and yet Jesus is pretty steadfast. He says, do not worry. And notice he doesn't say, well, you can kind of worry or or maybe worry every now and then. He, he adds it almost as a command, do not worry, you know, like do not steal and do not commit adultery and do not lie and do not kill. Jesus was serious about his call not to worry because he knew, as you and I know deep down, we may not say it, but he knew when we worry, what we're saying is that in some way we've lost faith in God. And of course, 
fear and worry, those aren't new things under God's Son. When Moses tried to draw back from his divine call to rescue the enslaved Hebrew nation because he had a stuttering problem, God assured Moses that he had no reason to fear. He wasn't alone. God was with him. When Jeremiah attempted to bow out of God's call on his life to be a prophet to a wayward nation because he was too young for the job, God said, don't be afraid. I'm with you. When an angel shows up and tells Mary she's about to be the most famous unwed mother of all time, he also captures and assuages her fear with four simple words. Do not be afraid. When Joseph wanted to turn Mary out because the idea of being a stepdad to the Savior of the world was a bit too much, God said, don't be afraid, Joseph. This is of God. And when Jesus rises from the grave, he tells the two women, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I love the word that Peter gives to the early Christians who, frankly, had good reason to fear in the face of a government bearing down on the tool, with the tools of imprisonment and torture and execution. Peter writes simply, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So faith, my friends, is the, is the antibiotic to fear. Faith is the antibiotic to worry. And faith is what we're all about as fellow members of St. Martin's, this body of the Lord's larger body. I think I've shared this with you before in a sermon, but my, my mentor, the late John Claypool, was traveling on sabbatical across Europe. And one evening he stopped in a small village outside of London and spent the night in an inn. And the room was small and simple. But the first thing that caught his eyes as he was settling in was an inscription over the fireplace that read like this. Fear knocked at the door, faith answered, and there was no one there. Fear knocked at the door, faith answered, and there was no one there. To survive in this world, this world you and I are living in right now, and frankly the next, we have to let go of our control. We have to collapse into his gifts of grace and mercy, forgiveness and love. And we have to give way to his presence. Prayer, prayer is our declaration of dependence. It's saying to Jesus, I can't do this without you. I'll be honest, I don't think St. Martin's, I don't think I could have made it through the last year or so without declaring my dependence, without praying. So I'm going to wrap up this portion of our time together by asking for your prayers. We need your prayers. But let's remember to depend on our Lord. And frankly, frankly, He depends on us. I said a little bit about that on my sermon on January 24th, if you want to click to that link if you missed it. You heard me say this uh, before, and I'll say it once again. When we reopen our doors all the way, hopefully, and we're going to open some before August. Some things we'll return to. But when we open all the way, and when it begins to feel like it once did, frankly, it won't be like it once was. We have a, a fresh opportunity to reintroduce St. Martin's to our members, to Houston, to Harris County, and now because of our virtual gatherings, to the nation, to the world. St. Augustine once described what it meant to be a Christian in this way. He said, a Christian is one who prays the prayers of Jesus, thinks the thoughts of Jesus, and does the deeds of Jesus. The core of our mission is to know Jesus Christ and to make him known in thought and word and deed. And one of the ways that we'll do this is by opening our doors through the expansion of our facilities, improvement of our grounds. So I'm going to bring this portion to close with a word of thanks. Uh, thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for being uh, family to one another. Thank you for being family to Laura and to Russell Evanson. Well, I want to say, I'm going to close by encouraging you to go to the next link uh, that is going to begin our tour together because I want you to see 
what you've made possible through the gifts of your treasure to St. Martin's. Thank you for all you're doing. That's the end of my annual report. God bless you. Now, let's turn to our tour.